welcome. We'll try this again. Good morning and welcome to New Baptist. We are so glad you have chosen this as your place of worship this morning. Let me highlight just a few things in the life of our church. First, if you are new to us, here there is a QR code on the uh, screen. You can use your smartphone. Take that, just take a picture of that. That will take you uh, to a Connect card, and that way we can get to know you a little better. Uh, if you would like to give us that information, we'd appreciate that. We'd like to greet you and let you know how glad we are you've worshipped with us. Uh, but also, if you have a prayer request, that Connect card is a way... Uh, that you that connects directly to us as staff and we have an opportunity to pray for you and and those things that's the easiest way uh, to get a prayer request to us also uh, in the foyer uh, on the tables as you're coming in you'll see a little bowl with little cards that have a prayer request on it uh, and you can put it there and we get those and those come directly to us as staff also want to remind you of our regular Wednesday schedule our uh, Awana for our children and the young people begin at 6 and in all of the adult Bible studies the women's studies uh, and then our adult Bible study begins at 6 30. Today I want to on behalf of our Operation Christmas Child uh, the shoe boxes and stuff just give you a word of thanks. Uh, as you can see on the screen uh, in January February we were collecting washcloths, combs and uh, brush, hair brushes and toothbrushes and to date we are well over a thousand in washcloths and combs and uh, hair brushes. We are close. We're 218 short on uh, toothbrushes. So if you have an opportunity and want to be generous you can just do that uh, but as we collect these through the year it allows us to meet our goal of a thousand boxes come this fall when we are packing those together. But again, just a word of thank you for your generosity, uh, for continuing uh, to make a difference in the lives of children and taking the gospel around the world. If you completed reading the Bible through in 2023, we want to celebrate that with you. Uh, it doesn't matter if you did it in 2023, but if you completed it, and if it took you one year, two years, three years, uh, we just want, if you've completed reading the Bible through, 2023 we want to celebrate that with you uh, and so if you would let the church office know that you've completed that you can do that through the connect card uh, and if you would do it that way or just send a note or call and talk to Pat in the church office this coming Saturday is our West Virginia Baptist Convention's annual Bible conference it's at our uh, conference center in Parchment Valley uh, that's at Ripley uh, but the keynote teacher this year is Pastor Trent, and he will be teaching, uh, I believe, on the book of 2 Samuel, uh, and if you would like uh, to attend, I'm sure there's a place for you, uh, but I just want us as a church to know that that's, uh, you know, Pastor Trent has been asked, uh, and we all know what a great teacher he is, but that will be a day focused with our West Virginia Baptist family on the book of 2 Samuel. And then one last thing is we are in the hiring process of a children's director. So uh, I believe that uh, we are receiving uh, applications through the end of February. So that's just uh, through Thursday of uh, this week. So if you know of someone uh, who would be interested or if you're interested, uh, there is a, you can find a, an application and stuff on our church website. You can go there and submit it that way or just get information to us here at the church office. You can uh, tag Pastor Lee with that, uh, and we would enjoy and really look forward to having applications for a ministry. Uh, and if, I don't know if you've, not know, if you've not noticed, you've just not been looking, uh, but our children's ministry is exploding, and we need that kind of leadership, and we're looking forward to having uh, a partner come with us in ministry in that. Well, here at New Baptist, we want to know Christ. We want to grow in his word, and we want to be a blessing where he has placed us. And part of growing in his word, as a congregation, we have uh, chosen each year a passage of scripture we want to recite and work at memorizing together. And this year, for the first part of the year, we're in Psalm 19. So let me invite you to stand uh, as we recite together the first uh, two verses of uh, of excuse me, Psalm 19. 
Together, church, let's say it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Pray with me, would you? Our Father, as we continue our worship today, accept our praise. Oh God, we acknowledge you as the God of heaven. Today, Lord, we want to worship you together. Thank you for the opportunity uh, of sharing our lives together, of growing together and being in this place. Now, Lord, as we sing and as your word is read and preached, accept it as our worship to you. And, oh, God, use us in this community to make a difference for Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Good morning. We have a new song for you this morning. Um, so we are going to sing the chorus before we start. But feel free to join in uh, whenever you're ready. There is a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, yes, it's mine. I've met the author of my story, and he's mine, yes, he's mine. I was lost by shame, could not get past my blame Till he called my name I'm so glad he changed me, darkness held me down But Jesus pulled me out, I am no longer bound I'm so glad he saved me, see I Now a new creation in Christ The old is gone, there's new life Faith, not by sight. There is a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. I've met the author of my story, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. Sin had left me blind, but Jesus opened my eyes. Now I see the light I'm so glad he changed me Now I'm walking free I've got the victory See it all over me I'm so glad he changed me See I Now a new creation in Christ The old is gone There's new life I live by faith Not by sight
join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that we have the promise of um, eternity with you, Lord, and that you claim us as your own. And God, this morning, as we um, bring our worship, Lord, and we bring our hearts, let us not forget how worthy you are of every ounce of our praise, Lord, of every word out of our mouth and every breath from our lungs, that you are worthy to receive all of our praise. In your name we pray.
Our scripture reading today is from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 12. I think I'm going to go to verse 14, though. Um, And the reason why we are reading this passage today is that this is a scripture passage that is prophetic. it's 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 a passage about the kingdom of heaven being manifested through the people of God. That's what it's about. And it's, a, it's in the book of Isaiah. It's a very prophetic portion of that book of Isaiah. And I'm reading it today because I believe in many ways it describes what is happening here among us in the context of the work that this church is doing. It's a powerful passage. Here it is, Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is not this a fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, afflicted, Then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as noonday. And the Lord shall guide you continually, and satisfy your desires in the scorched places, and make your bones strong, and you will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in, if you turn your back, turn, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call this day a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways and seeking your own pleasures or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I'll make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What a beautiful passage. And in many ways it describes um, what is happening here at New Baptist Church. One of the driving points of when we became a church was, was really wrestling with the question, how can we be a blessing to the community that God puts us in? And there's a lot of answers to that. There's a lot of ways that we are a blessing to the community that we are in, a lot of things that take place here and through you where God has placed you. But one of our primary ministries in our community, in the context that we exist in, is through our food pantry. Now, I know that every church has a, quote, food pantry. That's a very Monday way to say what actually is going on here. So I want to share a few things with you, and then I would like to recognize some people after I do. Um, In our food pantry, go back to the previous picture, we have close to 52 people who are volunteers. That's a lot of volunteers. It operates um, when it's open for people to come and receive assistance. It's open from 10 to 2 p.m. on Tuesdays. And there are many different types of ways that we care for people. There are some people who just walk in, no referral. We're able to help them when it says commodities, commodities up there. Those are things that are, are really given from the food bank that we just give to other people. We also receive people who are referred from information referral. They receive a very large food order. I'm going to share what that looks like in just a moment. We also receive homeless And obviously homeless do not have a kitchen by definition, and so we provide a special care package for the homeless of things that they can take and things that they need um, um, just just in their backpack. We also provide backpacks, uh, 100 backpacks every week to the Highland Elementary School. A lot of kids go to school there who don't have homes they can go to where food's cooked and prepared. This is a way to help care for children. We also do senior boxes um, once a month and also these Christmas boxes that we have a, a, 
a, um, a, a gift to help us do that. Just to give you an idea of what these things look like, they're on the screen. Everything's up here on the table, so you can, after the service, you can come and see what we do. There's our senior boxes, what we give in one box, and there's also two pounds of cheese that you're not seeing in that picture. Our, the, we, there's a f- um, shopping cart of food, and the volume of food will greatly depend upon the size of the household family. Um, here is our homeless kit. Again, these are things that we can put into a backpack and eat in, and not having to worry about do I have a kitchen to cook or not. And then there you also see the school backpack. A couple of numbers. In 2023, we served, in terms of food orders, um, nearly 10,000 people. Backpacks to Highland Elementary every week for the school year, right around 4,800. We have senior boxes, um, that monthly senior box, roughly 1,000. And, of course, the Christmas box. Now, the food that we receive... um, we receive it some from the Huntington Area Food Bank, and we pay for that. It, even though they get it free or get donations, they sell it to us at a very cheap bulk rate. And that's how we get a lot of our food. I understand we're going to get a lot of food from Target pretty soon probably, right? You know, coming from there. The total cost of our food pantry ministry last year was $88,000. That's what we do. This food is paid for. By the church budget, roughly 18000 is budgeted just straight away. We have um, memberships. Don't people, you, many of you, give over and above, and um, that's roughly $33,000. We have some gifts. Um, Seller Fuller is an example of that, roughly $4,000. We do have a deficit of $33,000. We have a balance that we're working from. This is not a fundraising pledge, I promise you. This is just the reality of what's going on right now, and it's a great reality. A lot's happening. And um, we get our food early in the morning. There's a group of volunteers who come and pick it up, bring it to the church, get everything prepared for when the door is open at 10 o'clock. So this is how we, as a church, um, in light of this vision, mission statement of when we began being a people who's compassionate about God's word, passionate about raising families in the ways of the Lord, and also seeking to be a blessing where God has placed us. That's part of what that looks like. Now, what I would like to do this morning is just say a word of thank you to those 52 volunteers who, um, who help out every week, and they've been doing so for years. I'm going to call up Joyce Mannon first. Where is Joyce? Joyce is the head of our food pantry. She is a director since um, we began. Do you want to say anything? Well, I just would like to thank everyone for their support and to give us the opportunity. And without you all, we could not do this. So our, we really appreciate it. And it's a fellowship and it's also a good work for the Lord. Amen. It is a fellowship. The people who come on Tuesday morning, that is a primary community that they have now. It's a beautiful fellowship. Not all 52 show up every Tuesday. Thank goodness, right? You know, be a lot. But if you um, would like to volunteer, Joyce will put you to work. She will find you something to do. I'm also going to ask Pat Bazin to come up. What did you say, Joyce? I said we couldn't do it without her. She helps us with our paperwork. Yeah, she, she, she gets the engine running a lot. So I'm going to ask Joyce and Pat. We do have a very small gift. I'm just going to name, start naming names. And if you are here this morning, I'm going to ask that you come up. I'll put it right here. And, and um, we'd like to come up. Just stay up here. Let us um, give you a, a gift. 
and we will do a word of prayer and applause after, after we are done. So some names. Jody Duncan. Mary McClellan. Hazel Kershaman. Ken Kershaman. Virgil Kelly. Gail Kelly. Tony Gigi. Joe Anderson. Carol Jones. Jeannie Harlow. Linda Bowen. Joanna Smith. Marie Nelson. Ann Spurlock. Clyde Mount. D. Mount. Haley Boyce. C.R. Brown, Denver Stevens, Linda Cummings, Larry Sumpner, Carol Sumpner, Trudy Elam, Teresa Foster, Carolyn Powers, Ray Spencer, Debbie Spencer, Donna Best, John Baisden, Donna Lipscomb, David McMillan, Vivian Atkinson, Jean Spurlock, Pete Jones, Bill Kindle, Kathy Meadows, Barbara Meek, Ethan Kelly, Emma Kelly, Derwin Sigmund. Now these are from our church, but there's also people from other churches who come on Tuesday to also help as well. And these are people, who volunteers from other churches. Dave Smith, Paul Stump, Carolyn Stump, Dan Jordan, Michael Mills, Garland Bowen, Reba Swan, Margaret McCoon, and Paige Best. I got bounced to the end here. Just stay, or I'll stay right there. Let, let's give them a round of applause and say thank you. I so often hear people say, what are churches doing? What are churches doing? What are churches doing? What are churches doing? You may be seated. Well, here's what churches are doing. This is what we're doing in the context of the community we live in. And so let's bow our heads together as we give the Lord thanks, continue um, just asking his blessings upon this work. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for these people who have... Um, give of their time and energy and, and, and talents and, and, and treasures, Lord, to, to make this possible. And Father, I know that, um, that we are only seeing those who volunteer. We're not seeing those who are served, those who are blessed. And Lord, I do pray for those who enter into this building, to those who receive care, that, that not only do they receive physical food, but they receive you. They encounter you in new ways. They recognize your presence. They, um, they, they, um, they, they know that what's being done for them is, is really from you, Father. And so I ask that your word may go out into this community. I pray that you continue to strengthen and support this ministry. I'm grateful for those who are, are so dedicated to it and lead it and, 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 and flex and bend and are patient and love and care for each other, Father. I'm grateful for how this is a community in our church, and I continue to ask your hand of blessing upon it. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for these people. I thank you for our, for our calling here to this location, to this place, to this town, to these people. May we indeed be a blessing to where you placed us. In Christ's name, amen.
God from ancient age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah, your history can prove, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast, and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. To me, from the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. As you saw just a moment ago on there on the screen that we are passionate about raising families, young people in the ways of the Lord, and we do that in part with Kids Church. So kids, will you please stand up? Let's give them a round of applause as they go out this morning. Since the beginning of the year, we've been in the book of Matthew studying what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. It is Matthew chapter 5 to 7. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest recording sermon or message that we have of Jesus. And as you've heard me say over the weeks that we've done this, over the months now, um, I, I do believe that Jesus preached this message in parts or in fullness or, or in kind multiple times in multiple places. Our passage today is Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 34. It's a section of passage that I like to call the heart of wisdom. Let's begin. Gracious Father, I thank you for this morning. I do ask your wisdom as we open up your word. May you, by your spirit, enliven our hearts May our minds be engaged. May we understand and, and think and ponder these things that our Lord instructs of us, Father. We thank you for this morning. In Christ's name, amen. A very old apologetic argument regarding Christ was popularized by C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. It's called The Trilemma. But, but the trilemma, this argument I'm about to share with you, is much older than Lewis. At least 200 years you will find it in different teachings and sermons. The trilemma is this. According to what we know through Scripture, according to what we see in Scripture, you have only three options about Jesus. Either he is a lunatic, absolutely out of his mind, 
or he is worse than that, I think, in a sense, in the argument, he's a liar. He's evil. He, he knows that he's purposely deceiving people. Or, this is what I think, right, where he is the Lord. He is exactly who he claims to be. And the argument is that these are your only three options. Him a great teacher, that's not an option. He's a nice person. He is, but he's more than that. These are the only real options that you have. He's either crazy, or he's evil, or he's actually the Lord, the Messiah, the source and giver of life, God made flesh. Now, I am reminded of this argument, the trilemma, because as we have walked through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says some really amazing things. Frankly, if he's not the Lord, it would be crazy things, beyond the pale, outrageous things that no normal person would ever say or claim according to what he says and claims. Here's some examples. Early on, Jesus begins the this, this sermon by saying that those who are miserable, those who are poor, those who are at the very bottom of the human food chain, persecuted, the meek, the outcast, Jesus says to them, you're blessed. And then Jesus points to himself. He points to himself what he says about himself. I am the fulfillment of the law. Who says things like that? Who claims that not only is the entire law perfected in oneself, but that the entire law points to himself? That's crazy talk. Unless you're the Messiah, unless you're the Lord. Or, or when Jesus quotes scripture, and he, he will say throughout the sermon things like, you have heard it said, you shall not commit, commit adultery, or you shall not murder. He's quoting Old Testament law. But then he says, but I say to you, he is claiming an authority even higher than Scripture. Who does that? Who can claim an authority higher than Scripture unless you are the Word of God? Well, today we come to a, another um, thing that Jesus says that is rather large. Another claim that he makes that is... That, is, that, that only the Lord can make, that only God can make. And the claim is this. The very best possible life that you can live begins with him. That's the claim. The very best possible life begins with Jesus. Jesus speaking begins with me. Not money, not education, not a good home, not a great job, not good health. And I'm not saying that these things are not good or they're not important. They are very important. But that's part of the reason why what Jesus says is so outrageous. The ability to live life at its fullest begins with Jesus. Ponder that for a moment. Even if you're poor... Even if you've never gone to school, even if you suffer from some chronic sickness or disability, even if you're old, even if you're young, even if you do not have a dream job, even if your life is full of mistakes, none of these things changes the fullness of life made possible in Christ because the best life possible starts with him. That is an amazing claim. But it is a claim that Jesus is making in our passage today. And for me to show you that claim, I want to do a, a brief biblical review of this biblical idea of wisdom. In the Old Testament, there are many different kinds of wisdom, many examples of wisdom. There's Wisdom given to those who built the tabernacle in the wilderness. There's wisdom given to, to King Solomon to govern well. There is even wisdom given to rock badgers who make their homes in the cliffs, Proverbs 30, 25. And thus we can conclude from all these different examples that wisdom in general, in broad general terms, is simply the ability to do something really, really, really well. 
There's wisdom to build buildings. There's wisdom to drive trucks. There's wisdom to lead people. There's wisdom to cook food. There's wisdom to raise money. There's wisdom to fix things, and so on and so on. And all of you, I am sure, represent all kinds of different wisdoms. There, there, all of you, many of you, can do certain things really well. You're, you're wise in a particular area. But what is biblical wisdom? Well, biblical wisdom, the wisdom that the Bible wants to give to you, is the ability, that I'm using the word ability, not knowledge, not just making good decisions, not, not just having an idea about stuff, but the ability, the knowing and the skill and the experience, the ability to live your life well at its very best. That's biblical wisdom. And because it is about living life well, Proverbs tells us, having wisdom to know how to live life well, it's more important than anything else. More important than jewels or gold or silver. It's greater than any wealth. This biblical wisdom is what people long for, what people desire, what people want. But unfortunately, many are walking on the wrong road called the way of destruction leading to the wrong house. The house of death. I, I'm, using, I'm using imagery there from the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 1 through chapter 9, wisdom is portrayed as a woman. She is called Lady Wisdom. And Lady Wisdom stands at the gate and calls out to people to walk down her road, the way of life, and enter her house, the house of life. Um, here, here we see this in part, just in cha- even in chapter 1, all through to chapter 9, reading what's on the screen there. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. And the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. Verse 33. Whoever listens to me, whoever hears my words and does them and listens to me, will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread or disaster. I share this because at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes a startling claim that he, Jesus, the Messiah, that he is the voice of wisdom and that we are to hear him. He says in Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine does them. He will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. This means understanding biblical wisdom. Jesus is making the claim about himself that the abundance and fullness of life begins with him. The ability to live life well, to live life at its best is wisdom. And wisdom begins with him. Now, some of you know your Bible. And you may be thinking in your head right now, something along the lines of, well, preacher, you're wrong. The Bible says that wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. And it does say that, Proverbs 9, 10, among 10 other places. This is correct. The Bible does indeed teach that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But what does that mean exactly? What does it mean to fear the Lord? That sounds odd. We struggle with that. Is it awe? Is it respect? Is it worship? What does that mean? Well, I want to suggest to you that the very best place to define what it means to be fear, to fear the Lord is our passage this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 24, is the very best place in Scripture to actually begin to ponder, this is what it means to fear the Lord. So what does it mean? What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means this. Number one, he is your greatest treasure. He is your greatest treasure. Jesus says... Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
For neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now there's a lot of debate as to exactly what this treasure is. And some people talk about crowns. And I like the thought, crowns that we are given to give back to him. He gives us something so we can give to him. I, I, I like what Paul says. You know, Paul talks about the church of Philippi or the church of Thessalonica. He says to, about them, you're my, you're my joy and my crown. So, so treasure may be people that we meet in heaven, people that we know, the people that we love. For me, that's a very real treasure. And I hope both are true. But my greatest treasure in heaven is the Lord, right? My greatest treasure in heaven is his pleasure of him saying to me, well done, good and faithful servant. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? How does wisdom begin? I believe it begins when he is your treasure. And number two, reading on, I also see Jesus say that wisdom begins to fear the Lord is his righteousness becoming your righteousness. This is verse 22. Reading on. The eye is a lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, this is using imagery, of course. And throughout Scripture, light or lamps refers to righteousness, which is the transformative work that Christ does in you and through you. Jesus has already said in this sermon, um, chapter 5, verse 14, to let your light shine, that you are the light of the world. Well, that light is the righteousness of Christ given to you at work in you, transforming you, working through you. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, I think it means, in large part, to seek his righteousness. Lord, I want your righteousness to be mine. I want to be like you. I, 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 by faith, I, I'm covered by your righteousness. Wisdom begins when you seek his righteousness. And now number three. What does it look like? What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means that he is your God. Meaning that he is first in your life, you trust him, and you depend upon him. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, throughout scripture, there's a constant theme of people worshiping false idols, of trusting in things and not of God. And, 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 what, and what is the greatest false idol that people trust in? Well, money, their own works, what they do. But wisdom begins when you put your trust in the Lord. And this is the wisdom of God. This wisdom of God leads you to the best life lived. It leads you to the way of an abundant life, it leads you to the way of a life that is full and, and rich. And this, of course, raises the question, what does that mean? What does a full and abundant life look like? What is the way of life promised to us by wisdom? How would you describe a life? How would you describe your life as a life that is full and abundant and well-lived? Here's how Jesus describes it. Reading on in our passage, verses 25 to 34, is a description of a life that's well lived. A life that is great. Listen to it. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Now, please note, as we read through here, Jesus will say this three times. Three times he will say to us, do not be anxious again. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. 
Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet our heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore... Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Um, This is a summary statement, right? This is basically what Jesus says from 19 to 24. Treasure him. Seek his righteousness. Look after him. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the beginning of wisdom, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus describes a life that is well lived as a life lived without fear. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. One of the rabbit holes I went down in thinking and researching this message was a poll conducted by the Washington Post of November of last year. And the poll was asking Americans, how do you define middle class? And according to the poll, nearly everyone said these things you need to have to be considered middle class. Here they are. This is the poll. A secure job, ability to save for the future, Ability to afford an emergency of $1,000 expense without debt. Ability to pay bills on time without worry. Having health insurance. And ability to retire comfortably. Now what struck me about this list is that five of the six criteria of what the people voice as to what they needed are all future-based. Are all fear-based. Do you see that? You see how they're all linked to future fears? Do I have enough money if there's an emergency? Will I be able to pay my bills without worry? Do I have insurance if I get sick? Will I be okay in retirement? And I think that we can relate to these fears, right? These anxieties regarding the future. Health and retirement and bills. And I think it's not hard to actually add more fears that drive people and how they live. Fear of failure, so I don't try. Fear of rejection or abandonment, so I put up walls. Fear of the unknown, so I don't leave my comfort zone. Fear of betrayal, so I don't trust. Fear of being vulnerable, so I always put on a false face or a false facade. Fear of loss, so I overly protect. Fear of conflict or confrontation, so I avoid difficult conversations. Fear of failure, to to meet expectations, so I have very low expectations. Fear of missing out, so I say yes to things I should be saying no to, right? These are internal fears that, that we carry, that dictate, that control how we function. And if you are unfortunate enough to turn on the TV, you get more fears, right? Fear of the election. Fear of chaos in big cities. Fear of wars with China and Russia. Fear of COVID and sickness. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And yes, there are many, many things that shape our lives, but it seems that fear always stands out as a great deconstructionist of a life well lived. No matter what you have, no matter how how blessed you are, no matter how great your family is, if there's fear, if there's anxiety, 
You're being robbed of something. It creates stress. It robs you of sleep. It causes depression. It makes you feel isolated. It impacts your thoughts and memory. It leads to substance abuse. Uh, it, it, it disrupts relationships. It impacts work, impacts family, impacts everything. And not only does fear and anxiety impact a person's quality of life, they also impact everything about life. Again, hear what Jesus is saying. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Your Father knows what you need. Your Father in heaven is good. Look at the beauty of this world. And every time you see a sunset or a sunrise, the next time you feel the cool breeze upon you or see the ocean or the springs or, or the forest, and how beautiful this world is, how good this world is, just think how much more valuable you are to the Lord. Therefore, don't be anxious what you eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. A life lived without anxiety or fear is a way of life that Jesus is telling us he can give to us, that he can give to you. A way of life that leads to fullness and abundance, a life that is well lived. And so how do you get this wisdom? How do you get this wisdom to lead this type of life? How do you get it? Well, I want to point to three things. And, of course, number one is our message today, um, the things that you heard this morning. Wisdom begins with knowing the Lord. Wisdom begins with knowing the Lord. In our passage today, this knowing him is defined as him being your treasure, as him being your righteousness, as him being your God, that person and place of trust and dependence. That's where wisdom begins. To seek him, to find joy and contentment in him, to obey him, to depend upon him. Have you done this? If not, this is where you start. Number two, and this is, this is, uh, this is from a couple weeks ago when we talked about secrets in the heart. So much of what we're talking about, what's going on in the heart. And I think it's possible for a person to think up in their head, I, 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 I know I should desire this, I know I should want this, but I don't. I, I want different things. I want things that are not good. I want things that are not righteous. I know I'm wrong, and I know I want that, but, but somehow there's a disconnect here. Help me with this disconnect. And, and a few weeks ago, we talked about changing out your secrets. People carry secrets of unrighteousness in them, those that they hate, lust and anger, things that Jesus talked about, the secrets of the heart. But then he goes on to say, Practice your righteousness in secret. So plant new seeds of righteousness in your heart so that those righteousness, those secrets are being changed out, that you begin to develop what is called a right order of desire, a right order of love. And finally, number three, we're told very plainly in Scripture, if you want wisdom, ask for it, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. Seek the Lord, ask him for that wisdom, he will give it to you. Many people have this thought, I want to call it a false belief, that there is a mysterious and perfect plan for your life kind of up there somewhere, and if you make a mistake, marry the wrong person, live in the wrong town, go to the wrong school, that somehow that perfect plan for your life is messed up. God can still do something with you, but you can no longer enjoy a full and abundant life. A lot of people have this way of thinking, and they've made mistakes, and so they kind of think, God's plan for my life is, in a sense, off the table. Or, people who are young especially, 
are so terrified of making a mistake, of doing something wrong, that they are in that bondage to that fear. This understanding is wrong. The Lord does not give to you a perfectly scripted life that you need to figure out and appear to. He gives to you wisdom. And it's by wisdom that you live in this created world made by a good creator. A world he made, a world full of bounty and beauty. He is a good God. And he will give you the wisdom you need to live fully in him. Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we, we, we get so up in knots and tangled over the events of the world. We allow our fears, our anxieties, our worries to get out in front of us, and, and when they do, we tend to We tend to shrink back, we tend to doubt, we tend to stop trusting, we tend to stop doing what is right and good, we we tend to lean into bad behaviors. And Lord, um, I do pray this morning that we may be receptive of the things that you have said and be like that wise man who builds his house upon the rock. May we have the wisdom that comes from you and trust you, may we treasure you. May we lean in and depend upon what you give to us, Father. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.
like you to stand with me as we close out this morning. This is a song of invitation. The invitation, very simply, is if you'd like to be prayed with or prayed for, we'd love to do that um, at the end of our service or after the service. If you'd like to make it known that this is the church God's called you to be a part of and like to join this community of faith, we'd love to welcome you and receive you and, and celebrate that. But most importantly, if you don't know the Lord, if he's not a treasure of your heart, treasure uh, of what of who you are, if you are not seeking after his righteousness, and you're not depending upon him, I invite you to do that, to, to begin that journey with the Lord today. We're going to sing This is My Father's World. I love this song. Um, I'm thinking of the birds and the, all the beauty of this world that is simply a reflection of how much God loves us. So let's sing together. This is My Father's World. <laughs> Smile.